Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see such a good crowd again here this morning. I'm Margaret Lowe Smith. I'm president of Atlantic Live, and welcome to day two of our morning briefing here at the DNC. I hope everybody had enough coffee and banana nut muffins to kickstart their day. Um, a few things to note before we get started. Um, first, I want to thank our underwriters who've made this week in Philadelphia possible. The American Petroleum Institute's Vote for Energy.org, AFT, PASIRA, and Maker's Mark. They're going to provide us with bourbon ballot Manhattans and delicate delights at the cocktail hour this afternoon. You'll have to come back at 4 o'clock for that. Um, and like yesterday, uh, after this session, our, our friends from Lululemon are going to come over and lead a meditation session. And uh, if it sounds like a joke, it's actually not. Um, I was a bit of a, a doubter yesterday, but I did it uh, just a couple minutes after the session. And I promise you, if you do, it will be worth your while and get your st uh, day off to a good start. Um, we are on Twitter at hashtag The Atlantic. We are live on C-SPAN. And um, after both of our, uh, our, our conversations this morning, we'll have time for your questions. So now to the subject at hand. Uh, as the Democrats gather here in Philadelphia, they ultimately have three major goals. First, win the White House. The other two, win back the House, win back the Senate. Uh, so the battle of the, for Congress is what we'll be talking about this morning. Uh, there are 34 Senate seats up for grab this year. 24 of those seats are controlled by the GOP. In the House, Republicans occupy 247 of the 435 seats on the ballot in, the, in November. So the Democrats have a big job. Uh, to talk about their chances. We've got an excellent lineup, so please welcome the guests for the first of our two conversations. New York Congress Congressman Joe Crowley, Vice Chair of the Democratic Caucus. <laughs> Congressman. Uh, Senator Chris Coons is the junior senator from Delaware. And New Mexico Congressman ben, Ru Lu ben Ray Lujan is Chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC. David Wasserman is the House Editor for the Cook Political Report. He is also known as an analyst on NBC News Election Night Decision Desk and for his book, Better Know a District. And leading the conversation, my colleague, Molly Ball. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Well, let's jump right in with the big question. Um, starting with the Senate, Senator Coons, are Democrats going to retake the Senate? I'm confident Democrats are going to retake uh, the Senate majority this fall. It is not going to be simple. It's not going to be easy. But as you look at the map, uh, given the numbers that were mentioned in the introduction, as you look at the candidates that we've got, and as you look at the resources we've got as a party, um, I'm fairly optimistic that we are going to take back control of the Senate. Um, if you look at the map for getting to four or five, um, I think it is relatively, at this point, straightforward uh, to predict what that path is going to be. Um, I'll say that Evan Bayh's decision uh, to jump into the race in Indiana, um, which you can applaud, uh, <laughs> makes a significant difference. Uh, Evan's up by 30 points in one poll, by 20 points in another poll, has $10 million in the bank and terrific name ID, uh, and I think he will contribute to making sure we're able to put it over the top. We're here in Pennsylvania. Um, Katie McGinty is running a good, strong, clear race after having millions of dollars of negative ads uh, poured against her uh, in the last six weeks. She's still up by a couple points. Last, briefly, by way of introduction, um, I'm optimistic about the resources we've got coming out of this convention. Um, if I were running in Pennsylvania, I'd want Joe Biden next to me every day as I was campaigning in Wilkesboro and Scranton, Scranton and Pittsburgh and Erie. Um, if I were campaigning uh, in Ohio or I were campaigning in Illinois or I were campaigning in Wisconsin, um, having all the different resources we have in terms of folks who have a national profile, who've got deep experience, uh, whether it's President Obama or it's my friend Tim Kaine, who's going to be a great campaigner on the stump, um, or it's all the folks who are engaged and volunteering uh, as senators to help our colleagues, uh, I'm optimistic. Coming out of Cleveland, you saw a very divided Republican Party. Um, they had a very difficult, messy primary process. The governor of Ohio didn't even bother going to the Republican convention in his own home state. Um, I think we've got a coherent and strong message, great folks able to deliver it, uh, and a run of candidates, and I'm happy to get into any of them, uh, who I think have real strong uh, choices uh, and real strong chances for picking up the majority this fall. All right, before I start arguing with you, I'm going to go to the Start arguing with you. <laughs> well, but let's go to the House. Uh, Congressman Lujan, are Democrats going to retake the House? I think Democrats are going to have a very strong gear this year. Um, you'll remember going back into 2015, 
uh, we launched an effort to create a battlefield of at least 65 seats across the country with recruited candidates. Many people uh, talked to us and said, look, you're not going to find uh, recruits in those 65 districts across the country. It's going to be very challenging. But then as we got closer to January of 2016 and uh, all of a sudden this candidacy with this guy named Donald Trump started to surge, the GOP could not stop him, uh, different things started to be said and there were different observations. Uh, look, here's the plain and simple. Uh, Democrats are in offense this year. I'm optimistic about where we are. Um, the 11 frontliners that we have this year have been doing very well. We challenge them all to win it in the off year, to develop strong infrastructures and reach out um, to their candidates, uh, uh, to their constituents, to the electorate across the country. Um, as Senator Coons always says, you need to make sure that you're leading by example with constituent casework as well and, and, and acting like a small town mayor in each and every one of these districts, and they have done that. And then we have uh, competitive seats across the country, 50 that President Obama won or narrowly lost, that solidified the base for those competitive districts across the country. And now we're working with uh, DGA, with President Clinton, with the DS, with um, all of our allies in those states where we will have battleground that consists of presidential battleground states, Senate battleground states, our districts that are battleground in those areas, as well as state house and state Senate seats. We we all have to be working together. And then in places like in Utah 4, where it's a state where we not, may not be playing with the Senate or with the presidential, but we're digging in into Utah 4 to make sure we have Doug Owens, have all the resources that he has. And we're recently seeing an expansion of that battlefield down in Florida 7 with Stephanie Murphy um, taking on Mr. Micah as well, uh, as you start to see the battlefield grow into Indiana, into Kansas and other areas. So I guess I haven't uh, made any predictions going forward with uh, the House, but I can tell you, Leader Pelosi challenged me to put the House in play. Um, we're working day in and day out with every vote across the country and every district, and we're going to see what we can do to maximize those wins uh, come, no uh, come November. So David Wasserman, I'm sure you noticed that the answer to my question was not yes uh, there. Can you provide us with a, an, an objective reality check? How do you like the Democrats' chances in the Senate and the House? Well, the Cook Political Report's current outlook is a Democratic gain in the House of between 5 and 15 seats. I don't think that would be a bad night. But uh, look, the Democrats' challenge is illustrated by Pennsylvania pretty perfectly. In 2012, the last time there was a presidential election, Democrats won 83,000 more votes for Congress, just counting House votes in Pennsylvania, but won five out of Pennsylvania's 18 seats. So Republicans were not only able to take advantage of the fact that Democrats are clustered in cities like Philadelphia where they're winning their districts with 80 or 90 percent of the vote, but they're also able to draw a map uh, after the 2010 census that packed Democrats into only five districts. Uh, and so out of the state's uh, 13 Republican-held seats, there's only one that we currently rate as a truly competitive race, and that's in the Philadelphia suburbs in Bucks County, the 8th district, which is open. Uh, and so if Democrats have a road to, to a majority, it will run through places like the Philadelphia suburbs. But in addition to a geography problem, I think it has been a challenge in terms of timing. Because if you, if you said last year, well, what's one thing that would, could really tank Republicans' majority in the House? How about a crazy, wacky nominee like Don, Donald Trump? But the problem in terms of, 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 of House-level uh, attachment to Trump uh, is that the filing deadlines had passed in 81% of districts by the time Donald Trump captured the nomination in early May. And so while there have been some Democrats, and I think uh, the DCCC has done an admirable, admirable job of getting credible candidates into races while there was still time to do so, uh, it, it was too late in a variety of districts. So I think a, a gain of between 10 and 15 seats would be a good night for, for House Democrats. Congressman Crowley, uh, that suggests that a big part of the Democrats' strategy is going to be running against Donald Trump. Do you see that being the biggest theme of your, your House candidates? Well, I think it's one of the big themes. Obviously, uh, David said it himself. What, what did you call him? Yeah. Crazy? Uh, <laughs> wasn't, we weren't saying that. Um, but even uh, Leader Pelosi said yesterday that he's the gift that keeps on giving. And I would just, I, I think you're right in terms of Philadelphia and the suburban area being uh, road to the to capture the house. I also don't think you can discount New York. Uh, you look at the first on Long Island, uh, great candidate Ann Thronholz, and then you look at Syracuse and Colleen Deacon, both running against incumbent Republicans. Uh, both districts have this history of going back and forth in election uh, in presidential election years, uh, and when you have, I think, you know, great candidates at the same time, this turnout that comes out. Um, that uh, doesn't speak well, doesn't bode well for Republicans in states like New York. And then there's a whole bunch of other, uh, there's about nine seats in New York that 
uh, we can be very aggressively engaged in. So I'm, I feel fairly optimistic. Now, you know, Ben Ray didn't answer the question, but it's certainly in the realm of possibility of talking about that. We have a much uh, higher hurdle uh, than the Senate does um, uh, to reach. And their playing field's a lot better. They have a lot more Republicans in play than Democrats uh, this year. Uh, but when do you recognize a landslide? You know, it's very unpredictable, I think, in terms of what Donald Trump will do, what he will say, uh, and what impact that'll have on the down part of the ticket. What I can tell you is that my colleagues who I see from time, or I did see from time to time when we were in session, they're on their heels. They're very nervous about themselves. Um, a number of my colleagues did not go to the Republican convention. Uh, they found an excuse, a vacation being one of them. Um, you know, they had stubbed toes and things of that nature. So uh, it really was remarkable to, to not only John Casey's in his own home state, but folks were not coming from around the country. I was there on Monday and Tuesday last week. I ran into a lot of folks, but, but I saw a lot of folks missing. And I, I think that's also something to keep in mind. They're afraid of their own candidate. Molly, could I add just one observation sure. there? So with the Trump uh, effect, and, and clearly the observation with Republican gerrymandering that we saw come out of 2010, the battlefield's different. And there were trends that were naturally going our way over time where we saw Republicans, uh, Republican districts getting more Democratic. Uh, families that were getting started, moving from the cities to the suburbs. So those trends, when you look at census data and voter registration data, you see those districts shift. And then the emerging electorate coming our way. Those were already coming to Democrats. Donald Trump is accelerating that. And that's an important observation as we look at a new battlefield across the country. On the other hand, you talk about a, a landslide right now, and this you know, could be a convention bump, but right now Donald Trump is ahead in most of the national polls. And, uh, and, and Nate Silver is saying if the election were held today, he would, he would win. I mean, Senator Coons, how much do you need a really strong performance by the top of the ticket to We need a strong performance, your... but if you take a look at a number of the states um, that we hoped might be in play, all the most recent polls show them actually in play. So in Arizona, in Missouri, in Iowa, in North Carolina, we've got candidates who in recent polls are within two to four points or in the margin of error against fairly strong, in most of those cases, incumbent Republican candidates. So um, yes, the national head-to-head -head is going to be bouncing around. I, I frankly would ignore all national head-to-head -head polls for the next couple of weeks. But in, the, in our battleground map, we have expanded it into several states mm -hmm. where we've both got stronger candidates than we might have hoped six months ago. We've got weaker opponents than we might have hoped six months ago, and where I'm convinced Donald Trump is making our candidates truly viable in places that would have been a difficult race two or four or even six years ago. Well, you mentioned Arizona. Uh, we had uh, Greg Walden in a discussion like this in Cleveland, the head of the Republican Congressional right. Committee, and what he said was that uh, it is easier to tie Democratic candidates to Hillary Clinton, who's unpopular, than to tie Republican candidates to Donald Trump, who's unpopular, mm -hmm. because Hillary Clinton is obviously a regular Democrat, whereas Donald Trump is not so obviously a regular Republican. It's easier for Republicans to distance themselves. In Arizona, uh, the Democratic candidate running against John McCain, uh, there's an ad against her now, uh, tying her to Hillary Clinton. Is that going to, is the top of your ticket going to be a drag for your candidates? Um, I don't think the top of our ticket will be a drag, particularly as folks get to know Tim Kaine. Um, some of the strength, some of the reach, some of the capabilities that he's going to bring will excite and mobilize and engage uh, voters uh, who might not otherwise uh, have performed at quite the same high level. Um, Tim Kaine is a progressive Catholic. Uh, and the combination of his service and experience on armed services and foreign relations, his time in Honduras, uh, his fluency in Spanish, and his ability to work tirelessly and connect in a number of states that might not previously have been in play, but where he and Hillary will help put them in play, makes me optimistic about winning a number of seats that even a month ago, um, a lot of the most optimistic predictions didn't say we were going to have genuinely in play. So I don't think she'll be a drag. I frankly think she and Tim Kaine will be a lift for us. David Wasserman, do you think it's significant that uh, Senator Kuhn seems to want to talk about Tim Kaine more than about Hillary Clinton? Do you think that the Democrats are going to look more at the, the second uh, person on the ticket? Well, uh, it's, it's certainly, I think, a, a solid pick for Secretary Clinton. And Tim Kaine is a happy warrior. I, I don't think that can hurt the ticket. Uh, in fact, I think it's really hard to find anyone in Congress who dislikes uh, Tim Kaine. But the Senate will be decided by the presidential race. The overlap between the presidential battleground and the Senate battleground is profound. There are only a couple states where there are competitive Senate races that are off the table, like Indiana, uh, per perhaps. But when you go down the list of, of, of uh, Illinois and 
and Wisconsin as the first two best Democratic opportunities in the Senate, uh, followed then by New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida. Uh, when you add in North Carolina and Indiana to that mix, I think those, those last five are going to decide uh, the fate of, of the Senate. And Senate Democrats have some advantages that Democrats in the House don't have. For example, some of the demographic shifts that are helping Hillary Clinton and Senate Democrats uh, are in places like Florida, where you have Puerto Ricans moving from the island to the mainland, particularly the Orlando area. And th those new voters uh, who are automatically eligible by, uh, by virtue of their citizenship, well, they're helping Hillary Clinton win Florida. They're also potentially helping Democrats in that Senate race potentially beat Marco Rubio. But that's a House district that Democrats already hold. So a lot of those trends are taking place, place in Democratic districts. But I would add Florida 26 and Florida 7, where we're also seeing an increased population with Puerto Rican voters. And now with Stephanie Murphy jumping into that race against Mr. Micah and the competitive nature, that redistricting shifted Florida 26. There is, a, at least in those two districts, we should see a bump because uh, of that, uh, that, that shift. Well, let's talk about the other side of the demographic coin. Uh, Congressman Crowley, you're from uh, a, a New York district, the Bronx and Queens, diverse place, but also a place that has guys who look and sound like you, right? Do you, do you meet a lot of these, these, these white working class Trump voters that we keep hey. hearing about? Not saying you're a Trump voter. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I apologize for stereotyping. I, well, but, but do you, do you, do you, you have you seen <laughs> among you your constituents or, or elsewhere evidence that there is a, a, a group of previously disenfranchised people being brought into the electorate by Trump? Well, I, I think first, you know, it's interesting. I come from the same borough that Donald Trump comes from. I call him Con Man Don, so if I refer to that once in a while, so not forgive a me. But, um, you know, he's someone who comes from Queens, uh, doesn't, uh, di didn't grow up anyway like I did, uh, and, and uh, th he kind of has disavowed his Queens uh, citizenship. And quite frankly, we, we don't like to refer to him being from Queens anyway, so it's kind of even. Um, do I think there is a bit? Yeah, I think there is a bit, but I think... Um, Keep in mind as well that Hillary Clinton served as New York State's senator for eight years, a U.S. senator. Um, she's incredibly familiar, not only as a political figure, but people know her. And uh, I think coupling that, and that's why I talked about the prospects in New York, um, there, there was a little bit of that, I think, a bit in, in terms of Long Island, you know, the first and third district, there's some concern about that. But you're also going to have a groundswell of, of the, the, the voters who come out every four years, African Americans, Latinos. Um, and we saw the numbers recently in Latinos. He just gets worse and worse and worse with Latino voters, a, a growing um, uh, uh, population on the island, for instance, that uh, is not as widely noticed. So um, you'd be, I think you'd be surprised that a lot of people who look and talk like I do, speak like I do, uh, are firmly behind Hillary Clinton. Uh, and uh, Senator Coons, you, you talked a little bit about the Pennsylvania Senate race. Yep. And this is a, a, a state that has been touted as potentially being put on the map by Trump's candidacy, despite having gone Democratic in the last several presidential elections. What's your view on that? Do you think Pennsylvania is in play, both obviously at the Senate level you do, but is it going to be more competitive than usual in the presidential? I, I think Pennsylvania is a key battleground state just because of the math. Um, if Donald Trump can't win Pennsylvania, I don't see a path to the White House for him. Um, we need to hold Pennsylvania in order to win the Senate. So it, it's going to matter um, for both sides in a critical way. I think it leans Democrat. I think there's developed this muscle memory of voting uh, presidential in presidential years. Uh, for Democrats, we've built up the machinery of get out the vote. But it is a state that swings back and forth uh, pretty strongly from election to election. We have the benefit of a Democratic governor, a Democratic governor whose chief of staff was Katie McGinty, who's our candidate for the Senate. Um, having come through what was a tough primary, uh, we've reunited the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie's campaigning very hard, but as I mentioned previously, she's also going to have some help uh, from a guy named Joe Biden. Uh, I've never met anyone who as tireless, engaged, and effective a campaigner at the grassroots level as Joe Biden. And I think Tim Kaine, frankly, uh, a progressive Catholic uh, who speaks to a lot of uh, central Pennsylvanians, is also going to be someone who's going to be here and be able to be helpful and effective. And I think the combination of the two of them working with Katie is going to really put this state away um, on the Democratic side of the column relatively early. I think um, many of us recognize the centrality of Pennsylvania to the outcome of this election and are going to be pushing to make sure all the resources, all the volunteers, and, and, and all the sort of airtime we can is going to get invested in Pennsylvania. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Congressman Lujan, about the, the issue set of this election. Uh, again, Congressman Walden, the Republican, your Republican counterpart, uh, believes that this election is going to turn on national security, 
crime, the kinds of issues that Donald Trump was talking about last week. Uh, do you see those as being the main things besides Donald Trump that your candidates are going to be talking about? Yeah, I think clearly that as we talk about this upcoming election cycle and the nature of what is on everybody's mind. Um, I was talking to Sean Patrick Maloney recently, a congressman out of New York. And Sean, Sean said, look, the assessment that I get when I visit with people is they feel unsafe, they uh, feel like things are unaffordable, and that things are unfair. And, and I agree with Sean Patrick's assessment. So as we talk about the notion of national security, whether it's foreign or domestic, we have a responsibility to keep people safe. We, we have to do that by securing our nation. Looking forward and making sure that economic security is something that's real, that uh, economic security can be built in such a way where families like the one I grew up in, uh, dad was an iron worker, mom worked in the local school district there, that that can't be taken away from you uh, overnight. And as we talk about what, where the anxiety is coming from, not just the economic anxiety that voters are feeling right now, but the real anxiety about the frustration with this outside secret money that's pouring into elections as a result of Citizens United coming from 2010. Democrats, Republicans, independents, it doesn't matter who you talk to, they're tired of this. So we have to do everything we can uh, by working to secure our democracy as well. Um, and in each and every one of those areas, we'll be working to make that contrast and to show the difference between Democrats and House Republicans. And here's, here's what I think is uh, puzzling to me. The Republicans who uh, recently set out a series of white papers to share with the American people what they will do if they're in charge in 2017. Well, here's the worst kept secret. They're in charge now. <laughs> and the American people are asking, well, why aren't you doing this now? As Congressman Crowley spelled out, House Republicans left home without doing anything about um, opioid addiction uh, across America. They left Zika on the table. They didn't help the poor people that are suffering from Flint, Michigan, and all the lead poisoning we have around uh, the country. Uh, and the list goes on, Zika and whatnot. So that's the difference, as I say, that the people across America want action. They want us to work together. But we all know that Speaker Paul Ryan, even when he made a commitment to move a piece of legislation that would address gun violence after the shootings in Dallas and Orlando, um, in Baton Rouge and up in Minnesota, and the events around the world that he was going to move a package. It got scheduled for a vote Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and each day it had to get pulled because the Republicans would not allow for that package to move. That's the problem Republicans have, and the American people are tired of it. So I welcome that conversation. Can I just add to that, though, as well? I think uh, Ben Ray is absolutely right. Uh, the, the nuance here is that there's one issue that House Democrats are identified with now, and with all due respect, even to the Senate, and the Senate did a good job in terms of the Murphy filibuster. Right. It was the sit-in on the floor, and when we go home to our constituents, people are like actually coming up to us and saying, that was incredible, you know? Uh, it's an issue that we have been identified with. I think House members, when they go back, Democrat and Republican are hearing about this. They have been, and we're gonna continue to keep that, bum, that drum beat going, because it's an example of not being able to get the most common denominator of issues Thank accomplished. You. It, we're not talking about reenactment of the, of, the, of the ban, of the assault weapons ban, which I'm, I would love to have happen, but I'm also a realist. We're talking about common sense measures that this Republican um, majority, they're in the majority now, as Ben Ray has said, and they have never uh, have, been, have been able to get that accomplished at all. So I think, they're in, I think that's one issue that we identif that identify with the House Democrats more than anything else right now. Well, Senator Kunz, do, do you think that gun control is a net plus for your... Senate candidates particularly? I mean, I'm old enough to remember that being some, somewhat of a third rail and Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid working to get the gun issue off the radar so that you could elect pro-gun Democrats in red states in particular. In purple states, in Midwestern states, do you think Democrats can run on, on a platform I, of gun I think um, closing the terrorism loophole and enacting responsible background checks is something where we've got the overwhelming majority, not just of Americans, but of Republicans, not just of Republicans, but of NRA members, mm -hmm. who say, okay, we may disagree about the assault weapons ban, we may disagree about the phrase you use, gun control, right. but on those two issues, making sure the people who can't get on an airplane because we're concerned they might be terrorists, they can go into a store and buy military-grade weapons without restriction, that seems, what, crazy. And even family members of mine, friends of mine who are gun owners say, you know, if I've gotta get 
a driver's license and show I've got insurance to drive a car, I, I'm fine with the idea that I have to go through a functioning background check system to purchase a weapon. We really don't have a functioning, coordinated, um, national background check system. There are loopholes that are too big and too wide. I think this can be a winning issue for us. I'm frankly going from here to a rally with Gabby Giffords and John Lewis about responsible solutions to the challenges facing us because of weapons. I think um, Congressman is correct. The average American feels unsafe and insecure about a number of issues. Mm -hmm. You will see Donald Trump try and emphasize the threat of terrorism. We've got the record and the answers because we're the party that has funded state and local law enforcement, has funded the Department of Homeland Security, and has prepared Americans to be safe in a way that the other party can't responsibly talk about, and they don't have solutions. We do. Congressman Lujan, one of the themes of this convention so far is the divisions within the Democratic Party. Your own uh, delegation from New Mexico is, is divided. Do you see that having an, an impact in, uh, in November? Do you think Democrats, a lot of former Bernie supporters, will stay home? I wouldn't describe it as being divided. I think that I come from a great state, um, the state of New Mexico, where we have passionate supporters uh, on, on all sides, and they're here. Uh, what's great about a small delegation like ours and a, a state that only has a population of under 2.4 million people is y'all know each other. Um, it's not six degrees of separation. It's maybe one or two. And when you come together united, especially uh, with the ugliness, the div divisiveness, the racism, the bigotry of Donald Trump, where, look, he even went to New Mexico uh, like he did in Ohio, and he went after our governor. I I've never supported Governor Martinez. I wouldn't vote for her um, going forward. But what he did was out of bounds. When Donald Trump went to New Mexico and attacked the Republican governor, he helped pull away those Republican votes as well. So not only in New Mexico, but across the country, with Senator Sanders speaking last night, with uh, our First Lady Michelle Obama's words of encouragement last night, with little Anastasia with her mom, talking about that she wants to become an attorney so she can help other people, that this is part of the process. We're coming together, and we will stand stronger coming out of this convention than the Republicans. And the point I'll make to highlight that, last week, both President Bushes weren't there. Governor Romney wasn't there. Senator McCain wasn't there. Um, uh, I don't know, they, someone told me Chachi was there, but that, uh, that was it. And so this week, Senator Sanders spoke last night. We're going to hear from President Obama, Vice President Biden. Uh, we heard from the First Lady. We're going to hear from Senator Kane. Uh, we're coming together in a strong way, and I'm looking forward to the difference in contrast, not only from last week to this week, but going forward to November. I want to take a couple questions from the audience, but while you're thinking of your smart question, David, what is the one or two bellwethers, either on the Senate or the House level, that you're going to be watching as we get closer to the fall to try to get your finger on the pulse of which way this thing is going? Sure. Well, two districts that really intrigue me are... Nebraska 2nd District and Maine 2nd District. And you might ask, what do Bangor, Maine, and Omaha, Nebraska have in common? Well, Nebraska and Maine are the two states that allocate their electoral college votes by congressional district. And those are the two districts that are conceivably in play. Now, Maine, uh, Maine's 2nd District is a rural, working-class white district where Donald Trump might have a unique appeal. Nebraska's 2nd District in Omaha is a white-collar, professional, diversifying district that might uh, be uniquely poor for, for Donald Trump. And uh, Brad Ashford in Nebraska, too, is a freshman cool. Democrat who's the first Democrat elected in Nebraska since 1992. Uh, Bruce Poliquin in Maine, too, is a freshman Republican, is the first Republican to be elected to the House in Maine since 1994. So there's an interesting symmetry to these districts. And I think if a party is, uh, manages to, to take both of them, they'll have a very good night. And Brad is way up in his polling, if we can take that as indication. Emily Kane is an an incredible candidate as well. So I, I feel really good about both those seats. All right, if you have a question, raise your hand. And when the microphone comes to you, please tell us who you are. Uh, keep it snappy. And uh, if you can, <laughs> let us know who you're uh, addressing your question to. Uh, OK, um, so my name is Rasa Ebrahim. Uh, this is to whoever uh, would like to answer it first. Um, so I'm 18 years old, and my demographic has really aligned with Bernie Sanders in the election. Um, how do you think Hillary Clinton can best uh, get my demographic to get um, uni help unify the party with all ages? Great question. Where do you see the youth vote going? I think it's a great question. I don't want to hear from the senator as well as the others. Um, but the, the first thing is, 
I don't think it's a theme that we're divided. I think it's an observation that maybe, film at 11, this protest at the Democratic Convention, you know, when has there not been a protest it's at one of our, uh, it's something about us we, we, we embrace. Uh, I think that Hillary Clinton today is a much, much better candidate than she was prior to the primary. I think Bernie has done a remarkable job. I don't think anyone here thought that Bernie, I don't think anyone here thought that Bernie was going to do as well as he did. And I give him a lot of credit for that. I, mean, I think Bernie thought he was going to no, do Bernie, as well as Bernie he did. definitely didn't know. Like Bernie was stunned. Uh, <laughs> but I think in the end, we, we, we're hearing fear. And fear goes you know, a good distance in terms of uh, uh, motivating people. Uh, but without answers, uh, without hope. Um, and I thought, listen to Michelle Obama last night, listening to Bernie talking about Hillary, as we go listen to Barack Obama, listen to Bill Clinton, uh, you know, and then the candidate herself. I think at the end of this convention, it's going to have that unifying effect that we're looking for. And not just we're looking for the effect, because I think people are gonna be, really believe in the Hillary Clinton that I know. You talk about I, think, I think if you yeah. look at three or four of the issues um, that millennials have said are central to their future, climate change, um, not just tolerance, but inclusion, LGBTQ rights, uh, and real economic opportunity and a plan for addressing college affordability college. and college debt. Those are all issues where on the platform, on the delivery, on the proposals and the policy, uh, the Democratic Party has, I think, um, strong and compelling ideas. And I expect both Secretary Clinton and Senator Kane to campaign on those issues, to push for those issues. And I think that'll bring a lot of uh, excited and engaged young people um, into voting for the Democratic candidates this fall. If I right, could uh, add, yeah, I mean, when you really drill down on the polls, and I think it's a great question, the, the main uh, observation different from t 2012 is the, is the huge undecided slash Johnson Stein vote, and that's being driven by young voters. I mean, they're, Johnson and Stein's numbers are double uh, what they are among young voters, uh, or d double among young voters what they are among older voters. Uh, and if there's one theme, we were talking about the issues driving this election, if there's one theme that I think not only appeals to, to Bernie Sanders' base, but also wards off Donald Trump's advancements on blue collar workers, it's rebuilding America's infrastructure at home. Uh, I think the more Democrats talk about it, the better they'll do. One more question. Let's go right back there. I'm uh, Gail Brewer from New York. And yesterday at this wonderful breakfast, we learned uh, change uh, versus steady. And the notion of change, but uh, the Trump folks don't seem to care what kind of change. And, and yet steady to them sounds bad. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of some of the candidates you're talking about, how do you address that? Because as... I mean, I think if you talk about change, we all want to know what change. But I guess some voters don't care. They're just changed because of all the issues that you raise and the concerns and so on. So how do you deal with this change versus steady? Because Clinton is steady, and to me that makes sense, but I guess not to a lot of voters. Great question. Yeah, someone at the Republican convention called her the secretary of the status quo. Congressman Lujan, is that a, well, a burden for your ticket? Well, Molly, what I would say is I see there a difference between good change and bad change. And this goes back to the previous question as well with what will it take uh, especially to reach out to millennials and to work together. Um, in the same way that millennials innately inside of them have a sense of social responsibility to stand up to bullying, to racism, to bigotry, um, to injustice, wherever they see it, they don't wait for someone else to do something about it. They organize and they stand up to that. Donald Trump is bringing about the wrong change for America. Uh, policies that most foreign um, uh, affairs experts have suggested would make us less safe as a country, withdrawing from NATO on economic issues, with, withdrawing from the World Trade Organization, and looking at what the cost of his economic policies domestically would have on the American people, namely burdening working people um, in America with his economic plans. Um, and that doesn't even begin to talk about making fun of people with disabilities, um, people of Mexican heritage and our Mexican brothers and sisters suggesting that Judge Gonzalo Curiel cannot hold his job as a federal judge because Donald Trump said he's going to build a wall on the southern border that Mexico will pay for. That shift, in addition to not disavowing David Duke when the question was asked of Donald Trump what he thinks about white supremacy and, and, and David Duke, that has no place in American politics, and that's not the change that I want to see. I want to see what Secretary Clinton has been pr pr promoting and, and putting forward, as well as where it aligns with Senator Sanders. Overturning Citizens United, putting the people's, back, putting the people's voice back in the people's house, um, 
economic security when it comes to a more affordable college education, unsaddling students with that student loan debt, making us safer in America by having tough and smart policies that will achieve that. I, I just, that's the, the vision that I have going forward. And if there's no one that could have said any better than our first lady, Michelle Obama, last night. Okay. Who does she trust over the next eight years, four to eight years, with making sure that we're going to be moving in the right direction with an eye on her girls. That captured it for me. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Senator Coons, Congressman Lujan, Congressman Crowley, and David Wasserman. We're gonna move on to the next segment of our panel. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mark. So now we are turning to demographics. There was a fascinating recent survey from Pew that found that the most common age for white Americans was 55, and the most common age for Hispanics is eight. So you can see from that in a snapshot the way things are trending in this country. I want to welcome to the stage Carlin Bowman, Senior Fellow and Research Coordinator at the American Enterprise Institute, and Rui Teixeira. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Uh, so demographics, the sort of under, which we've been talking about the surface politics of this election, that's the underlying uh, current, right? So let's start with the big picture. In your view, Carlin Bowman, how is the electorate this year going to differ from the electorate of four years ago or eight years ago or 20 years ago in terms of its makeup? Well, thank you very much, Molly, and thank you to The Atlantic for inviting us. Um, Rui Teixeira um, at CAP and Bill Fry at Brookings, and I'm at AEI. We've been working on this for about the last 10 years together, and our big report on states of change is available on all of our websites if you'd like to work, look at the work we've done. I think the growing racial and ethnic diversity of the electorate is by far the most important long-term trend changing the electorate over time. And what does that mean in practice? Uh, what, well, are, what are some of the numbers? If, that um, if minorities could be as much, perhaps, as 30% of the electorate today, groups that have voted heavily Democratic in recent elections, that's an enormous plus for the Democrats. So demography favors the Democrats at this point. What was it four years ago? What was it eight years ago? Well, it was 27% four years ago, and it could be as high as 30 this year if you add the total minority population. And yeah, basically, like clockwork, the share of minority voters tends to go up by a couple of percentage points each presidential cycle. And at the same time, obviously, the white vote goes down by two points, but it's, much, it's heavily concentrated, over-concentrated among white non-college voters who are the most conservative voters. And you actually tend to have an increase in white college. So the changing mix of the electorate, is, as Carlin's alluding to, just tends to push the Democrats forward. You've got minorities who vote 80 percent Democratic, uh, you know, increasing, you've got white non-college voters who vote like 36 or 37 percent, a Democratic decreasing. You know, it's a recipe for pushing things in a certain direction, though obviously demographics is not destiny, but it matters a lot. Well, so you said like clockwork. Are there anything, any variables that could change this mix, whether uh, changing turnout expectations we've heard about, maybe many more uh, Hispanics who are eligible for citizenship seeking naturalization just so they can vote? Do you, what variables do you see affecting this? Yeah, no, the, 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 the key variable here would be differential turnout trends among different segments of the electorate, like white non-college, like Latinos. Um, but it should be stressed that even if you see some of this, these differences, it's not likely to affect the basic trend much. In other words, it could be the difference between minority voters going up by 2.1 percentage points instead of 1.9 percentage points, because what's primarily <coughs> driving these shifts is just population change. And even differences in turnout aren't going to make as much difference as you, might, as you might think. Look, Latinos already vote in 2012, a pretty good Democratic year, 16 points under white voters, and you still see the result that, that we saw. So I would not expect Latino turnout to crash in this election. Mm -hmm. I expect it to go up. Um, you know, white turnout, we'll see. But I mean, I think to the extent we see greater white turnout, it's likely to be counterbalanced in this case by uh, increased minority turnout. But, you know, that's a variable, but just to stress that the key thing driving these changes is not turnout patterns, it's population change. Yeah. Carlin? But we are also looking at some key groups and thinking about how they'll turn out in November. Will young people who supported Bernie Sanders stay home? That's an important question. We don't know the answer. Will married women who've been a pretty solidly 
Republican group uh, over time? Are they really going to turn out for Donald Trump? That remains to be seen. Will African American turnout be as high as, as, as it was for Barack Obama? That's obviously going to be enormously important to Hillary Clinton going forward. And so these, these are also the kinds of things that we're looking at, but Rui's absolutely right. The issue is differential turnout. Well, Rui, you famously wrote, uh, co-authored uh, The Emerging Democratic Majority back in 2002. Looking back on that, and that was a, a, a thesis primarily about the increasing diversity of the electorate and population change leading to a, demographic, a democratic advantage in elections. What would you change about that book if you were to write it with perfect hindsight? If we were going to write it right now, I mean, I think the basic thesis mm -hmm about the presidential coalitions turned out to be, by and large, correct. The groups that we thought were growing did grow. They moved in the direction we thought, and the states that we targeted as being moving toward the Democrats basically did. Um, if we were writing it today, I think we'd do a couple of things. One is deal a little bit more with the issue of Congress, because we do see Congress is basically a big lag variable now behind the changes taking place in the country that are pushing presidential elections in a certain direction. So talk more about that, about the prob structural problems Democrats may have translating their demographic dividends into, into electoral payoffs. Um, some of the issues around that I think we talk about. And then there was a few states that we were kind of behind the curve in realizing how fast they'd shift in the other direction toward the Republicans, the Appalachian states. Um, at that point, I think in the book, we still categorized West Virginia, at least for the near future, as a democratic state. It turned out not to be true, at least in presidential. So um, those are a couple things we changed. But, you know, I'd have to say that the basic thesis seems pretty solid. You know, I'm, I stand behind it. Carlin, would you agree with that? I do agree with that. Um, I think, as I said, demography favors the Democrats. Um, geography probably still favors the Republicans, at least a little, and it will in this election overall. But I think Rui is right. The Republican Party needs to wake up to these extraordinary demographic changes in the electorate. And what would that mean? Well, um, it would, they'd probably start with a lot more outreach to minorities and Latinos, starting with the Latino population. I think the African American vote is a pretty solid Democratic bloc overall, so I think it'd be hard to make inroads there, though interestingly, young African Americans are less Democratic, but not more Republican. They're moving into the independent camp like so many other young Americans. But I think reaching out to the Latino population is going to be essential for the Republicans moving forward. And I also think thinking differently about the growing number of single women, a number, another demographic that we've identified in the states of change work overall, that's going to be important over time because that group is growing. And Rui, you mentioned the idea that demographics are not destiny. I'd like to drill down on that a little bit. Do we ever see sudden shifts in population groups? Haven't we seen, for example, uh, the Asian American vote become much, much more democratic than it used to be in the last couple of cycles? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, if you go back to the early 90s, 1990s, the Asian vote, Asian American vote was actually Republican leaning, um, but it's changed dramatically since then. It's partly a result of immigration in the United States, partly a result of the Cold War disappearing and the communism no longer an issue, partly a result of just these voters have shifted to the left. These have always been fairly pro-government voters, Asian Americans, and that's really uh, come out with a vengeance to the point now where the party ID advantage of Democrats among Asian Americans is actually slightly larger than among Latinos. So you can have population shift. The biggest and most consequential within group shift we've probably seen in the last 40, 50 years has been the shift of white non-college voters from the Democrats to the Republicans. So what that enabled the Republicans, I mean, these demographic changes that are pro-democratic have been unfolding for a long time, but they were completely swamped to begin with by the movement of white non-college voters into the Republican camp, particularly in presidential. So um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here. And, you know, we hold everything equal and you push forward. And we have a big report about different scenarios called America's Electoral Future that our project also did. Clearly, if you push forward with the basic patterns we have now, it's a big advantage for the Democrats, especially several cycles down. But you can also simulate what the results are, for example, if the Republicans increase their their share of the white vote by five points, which we did in our report. If you do that, they could, they could continue to win presidentials until about the year 2028, holding everything else equal. Eventually, even that runs out of gas. But um, demographics sets the playing field, but it doesn't certainly determine all the outcomes. But it, I think it tells parties some of what they need to do and not do. 
Mm -hmm. well, well, Carlin, so often these discussions about demographics are deeply uh, uh, pessimistic for Republicans. <laughs> Do you see any uh, encouraging, uh, any, si any opportunities for optimism in the electorate uh, or, or is Republicans' entire coalition staked on the parts of the electorate that are getting smaller and dying out? The Republican coalition is getting smaller. You see, as Rui said earlier, that the white vote that's been the basis of the Republican Party is shrinking by about two percentage points every four years. That's very significant. Um, I'm not sure I see a lot of enormously positive things in the data for the Republicans overall. I think their post-mortem after the 2012 election clearly reflected that they're aware of some of these challenges going forward. But clearly, I think breaking into the Latino vote over time is going to be very, very important, and they're going to have to do more work in that regard overall. But, you know, issues matter, elections matter, candidates matter. We're looking at a lot of states that could be in play this year that we never would have expected um, before. Donald Trump seems to be doing better in the Rust Belt, and Hillary's doing better in the Sun Belt. And I went back and read Ron Brownstein's 2009 article on the, on the uh, the blue wall, the 18 states that had voted in 2009, straight Democratic for five presidential elections, the, the longest trend since the FDR election. And then I looked at those states again um, after 2012, those same states voted six times for Democratic candidates overall. Um, but now some of those states, Michigan in particular and Wisconsin, are conceivably in play, at least based on some of the most recent polls. So these trends do change, and so there are some opportunities perhaps for the Republicans that there weren't four or eight years ago, in part because of issues and candidates and all the rest. Roy, do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think in a sense, it, you know, you can also put a demographic lens on that, right? Where mm -hmm. Trump's uh, chances seem the best, it's areas where states where the white population is still is large, where it's old, Mm -hmm. um, and where the minority population and other shifts are actually quite slow. There's, they're relatively static states. You're, you know, Wisconsin's, you're Michigan's, you're Ohio's. Um, so I think that it makes sense that those would be in the target zone and have some chances of, mm -hmm. of moving in the other direction this election. That said, I'm a little skeptical of the ability of, of Trump to move an adequate share of the white non-college vote so far in his direction as to swamp all the other uh, trends in the general democratic lean of these states. Mm -hmm. And it really does look like the white college vote is going to swing pretty heavily toward the Democrats. So that means in a lot of these states, you've got to not only overperform what you previously did among white working class voters, you've got to massively overperform. And I just think it's, it's a tough calculus. Yeah. Well, Democrats have this demographic advantage, advantage in presidential elections, but how do you explain the abysmal performance in midterms that we've seen for the past couple of cycles? Can that really only be explained by turnout of different groups? Well, turnout is clearly very important, um, and so too is is the sort of strong federal system. And you think about all of the different elections, and the fact that Democrats are largely uh, clustered in big cities. Uh, density equals Democrats is another Democratic adage. Um, so in that sense, um, Republicans have done extraordinarily well down ballot in governorships. Even after this election, they'll probably hold a majority of the governorships. They've picked up over 900 state legislative seats since Obama took office. So there certainly is something else going on. And I think it's related to uh, changing demography, but also to the fact that these are more localized elections. Is it also the changing dynamics of the parties and the, the reorienting of the, their coalitions? Because I'm old enough to remember 2006 when Democrats mm -hmm. won a midterm. Roy, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that um, certainly the coalitions are different. The coalitions uh, that Republicans have turn out in these off-year elections, uh, and there's bigger drop-off among Democratic constituencies. But it's, I think two other things that are important here. One is that the Republicans have done a great job focusing on House and state legislative races. I mean, I think to some extent it's a product of the fact that some of these other changes are not good for them, so they want to maximize their impact on governance by by mopping, mopping up in these mm -hmm. off-year elections and in these House and lower seats. And I think they've done a better job than the Democrats in focusing on that. The second thing is something David Wasserman mentioned earlier, which is their structural advantages below the state level for the Republicans, typically. The way districts are drawn, 
partly for gerrymandering, but a lot just because Democrats insist on living next to one another, um, and, and they, they, they sort of minimize the effectiveness of their votes. So Republicans have far more districts that are basically 55-45 Republican. Uh, the Democrats have too many districts that are 70-80% Democratic districts, really, and that's waste, just waste votes. So you can win a majority of the House popular vote, as the Democrats did, for example, in 2012, and still uh, manage to lose, uh, you know, lose in the House. So, I mean, there's indications now that if the Democrats want really have, would have to carry the House vote by like 54-46 to get a majority of the House seats. And that's, you know, that's not fair maybe, but that's the way it is. And it definitely uh, helps the Republicans at this point. I want to take a couple questions, but first, do, do either of you see any uh, sleeper subgroups among the electorate? Some, we've heard a lot about, for example, uh, single women. Are there other groups or, or, or demographics in the electorate that have not gotten as much attention as sort of the big blocks uh, that, that you think uh, could either come on the radar this year or, or that you're interested in? Well, I think I'm going to be looking at African-American women um, in part because the rate of voting by African-Americans in the 2012 election was actually higher than the rate of voting by, by white Americans for the first time in our history. And African-American women in particular look very enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton. They've gotten quite a bit of attention. Um, she spent a lot of time uh, courting that vote overall, and I think that'll be very, a very important vote in the fall. Well, I don't know if they qualify as, yeah. as a group that people haven't been paying attention to, but maybe less so than some of these other groups over time, but white college-educated women. I mean, I just think they're going to be really big this year, and I think they're going to swing very dramatically in the direction of the Democrats, and that's going to swing the whole white college-educated vote, as I was alluding to earlier, toward the Democrats. And that's, as these things go, that's, that's a big change, I think, yeah. as Ron Brownstein pointed out the other day. Uh, Democrats haven't carried the white college-educated vote, you know, practically ever since yeah. polling has been uh, testing these things. So I think that's, that's an interesting thing to... Well, I'm so excited to be in a key demographic. <laughs> Who's got a go. question? Uh, Raise your hand. Don't be shy. The microphone is coming to you. I can't totally see with the lights. Okay, there's someone right in front of the blinding light right there. Tell us who you are and uh, who you want to ask a question of. Hi, um, my name is Miles Burnett. I, my question is for both of you, I guess. I'm from California's 24th district, which is both a very young district and a very white district. Um, and both in presidential and it's an open house seat this year, do you think the youth or the fact that it's a very white district will play, um, it's, a, it's relatively a purple district, uh, do you think, which one do you think will be, be more important in the vote this year? And I'm not enough of a house nerd to know whose district that is. Who's your, who's your member of Congress? Uh, Lois Capps, she's retiring this year. Ah, okay, great, thank you. What are your thoughts? Well, young voters are not necessarily the most reliable voters. Maybe they will be this year. Um, their turnout rate is not particularly high, and so I'd probably look at the white population. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit hard to suss out the, yeah. the sort of the contending forces here, because I don't know that much about the district. But, I mean, I do think that the performance of young whites, which is this, obviously a subset of the white vote overall, is going to be quite important, because if you look at the difference between whites by generation, it's quite dramatic between white millennials, for example, and white older generations. So to the extent that, you know, a presidential election can propel these white millennials into action in a district like that, it could be quite significant and tip the white vote a little bit more toward, toward the Democrat. Um, and, you know, my sense is, I think, I mean, youth drop off in off your elections is huge. And I think this is an exciting election. We know People are really interested. We know levels of campaign interest are higher than they've been for a long time. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a spike in, in youth turnout, mm -hmm. uh, certainly relative to the last off year, but maybe even relative to the last mm -hmm. presidential. I think, um, you know, people are, a lot of young people are going to think, well, you know, maybe I like Bernie Sanders or maybe I'm not crazy about Hillary, but at the end of the day, this guy Trump is insane and I have to go out and, and vote against him. So. Um, I think that's, that's something to watch, the white youth vote. I think it may be quite impressive in this election. White, white millennials did vote for Romney, including white millennial women by a single percentage point. That's an interesting Right, so if wow. the Democrats move that back toward a tie. Yeah. And don't we also hear about young people that they're increasingly detached from the political parties? 
increasingly. They're, they're certainly much more independent than, yeah. than other generations. Um, and they seem to be, just interestingly in the polling data, which I spend a lot of time on, look, they seem to be much more interested in state and local than in federal, national politics where they think everything's broken. Interesting, okay, one more. We're gonna go right, right up here in the middle. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, right, right back there, you've, you've got the microphone. Yeah. Hi there, um, I'm Danielle Ortiz from Austin, Texas, and I'm 18 years old. Um, given how many questions there are circulating whether or not millennials will show up to vote for the presidential election, do you think it'll be a key demographic given um, congressional districts that are coming up? Great, and, and we, we sort of addressed that a little bit, but um, as you mentioned, Rui, that's sort of the Bernie vote, yeah. and there could be a chance that, that, that they get discouraged. These are idealistic young people, haven't participated in college, in, in, in elections before. Uh, could they look at this election and say, I'm staying home? Well, I, I think they could, but I think at this point, I'm, I'm, I question that. I mean, I don't really see the evidence for why that's likely to happen. If you look at the, uh, the vote of people who are consistent Sanders supporters, Pew just did some analysis about this and you know, sort of look at who they're going to vote for today, it's like 90% for Hillary Clinton. I mean, you know, there's, there's, I don't think there's that much reluctance to vote for Hillary in this context. And, lack of re and, and if they have a reasonable commitment to do that, I think at the end of the day when the campaign ramps up, the choices are clear, I think they probably will get out to vote you know, in, in numbers that are equivalent to before and maybe even higher. We'll see. Um, and if they come out to vote for the president, they're going to vote for the House as well. I mean, drop-off is pretty small between a, a presidential vote and the House or Senate vote. So um, the key thing is, is getting them out there for the election in general. Once they're in the polling booth, they're going to vote for, for all the offices, which is, is going to help the Democrats, I think. Carlin, we hear so much that, that, that ticket splitting is dead. Do you think there's any chance it comes back in this election? I think it could, could come back in this election, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you, Carlin. Thank you, Roy. We'll be back today with a lunch program on criminal justice reform at noon, so please join us back here at the Atlantic Space. Thanks, everyone.